maybe you picked up on the theme for tonight's service about Jesus Christ. If you miss that, well, you miss the point of church. It's Jesus. It's always been about Jesus Christ. Don't make it about anything else. It's about, you come here for Jesus Christ. You don't come here for me. You don't come here for your friends. Though I hope you have friends here at First Baptist Church. We come here because of Jesus Christ. And I want us to always remember the fact that with Jesus, we have everything. Without him, we have nothing. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses his own soul? I'm glad you're here tonight. Thankful to be at church, aren't you? And be able to worship as a church family. Have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 1. If you would please, Colossians chapter 1. I was told before the service that there's a water, uh, there's a water warning in Bridgeport. You have to bo- boil the water in Bridgeport. Thankfully, I had, boiled, I had bottled water up here, so I'm okay. But uh, what will they think of next in life, right? What will come next? We can't even drink water without, oh my goodness gracious. Thankfully, Jesus is still in charge. Now let me just ask here real quick, anybody too cold in the auditorium? Raise your hand if you're too cold. Anybody too warm in the auditorium? Right, Carol, I saw that hand. I saw the hand, Carol. Anybody just right? All right, see, wonderful. You can't please everybody. That's what I found out. We'll do our best during this time. This spring and the fall, the hardest times for the climate control in a church, it's obviously a large auditorium, we have to start early. So we have to guess where it's going to be. And you know how your systems at home have auto, heat and cold at the same time? The systems here have auto as well, but they never guess the right one. So like it's hot outside, it's got to be hot inside. So we manually set that. We'll miss it some services, but feel free to share with us if you're, your climate needs. We don't mind at all. And especially you, Carol, you can always tell me how you feel at church. Sorry, that slipped out of my mouth then. No, no, I'm glad you're here. I don't mind having a good time here at church. And uh, we even have some extra air conditioning for the stage. So the stage is not, is not the same as out there. And uh, so I can sweat away or cool down up here, and you can sweat out there. It doesn't matter to me. But I'm glad you're here. Looking at, at tonight at Colossians chapter 1. If you have your Bibles open, Colossians chapter 1, entitled The Message, The Master Designer. Talking about Jesus Christ and what he does in your life and in my life. I was studying for this particular, this particular verse in our series on Colossians. And I don't know how long it will take to go through, through Colossians. I've not set a time limit on it. We're going to work through it. Sometimes one verse, sometimes a few verses. Tonight's just one verse. But I tell you, it, the deeper I get into Colossians and outlining and studying it, the more I'm impressed and enthralled with the idea of Jesus Christ. Singing that song that I, I'd rather have Jesus Sometimes, my friend, it's just a song, isn't it? It's not the truth. We sing it, but we don't always mean that. To our shame, to our travesty, it ought to be true every day of our life. I'd rather have Jesus than anything else. And here in Colossians chapter 1, we have another concept from Paul about what Jesus Christ is doing every single day in your life and in my life. Look with me, please. Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. In the body... Of his flesh, through death, talking about what Jesus did on the cross, and here it is, to present you, that is you, that is the saints, that is if you've been saved, then you could put your name right there. If you're saved, that is you. If you've asked Jesus Christ to save you, whether it was 20 years ago or 20 seconds ago, once you're saved, your name sits right there. If you've been saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ by faith to present you. Jesus Christ has a personal mission, a personal purpose for every single saved individual. It is not just a corporate idea. It is not just for moms. It is not just for for pastors. It is not just for missionaries. It is for every single Christian, no matter how long they've been saved, no matter what their background is, no matter what their talent set is, no matter where they're at in life, no matter what they've been through or the decisions they've made, whether good or bad, every single Christian has a personal purpose from Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but that is comforting. Not only does he know my name, not only does he know the number of hairs in my head, he cares enough about me to have a special plan just for J.D. Howell, and it's different than you, Ryan Kemp. It's different than you. And it doesn't, because he loves you or me more, it's not about that. But we get caught up in that. Well, if God loved me as much as them, then I'd have those blessings. No, he has a special purpose just for you and just for me. And they're going to look different in the process. The process is going to look different between you and me. Because there's some things in your life 
that he has to fix and some things in my life that are different. It's going to be a different process. Don't get caught up in the process comparing yourselves to someone else. The scripture says, comparing themselves among themselves, they were not wise. If I was writing the Bible, I'd add this little phrase, but they were normal. Because we compare ourselves among ourselves. I'm doing pretty good compared to so-and-so. And one day, hopefully I'll be like so-and-so. Comparing themselves among themselves, if I can, in the vernacular, they were a bunch of morons. They were not wise. They were fools, foolish. The process will look different, but Jesus Christ has a purpose. He has a purpose for you and for me. Every single Christian, you put your name right there to present you, fill in the blank of your name. And here's what he's doing. Holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Tonight I want to talk about and look at the presentation of Jesus Christ. There are times in our schooling career, academic career, that we have to do presentations. There are times in jobs that you have to do presentations. It's what I do every single Sunday. Some of you men and ladies have done presentations at work. Some of you high schoolers have done presentations for science fair projects. Present, I present you what I have done or what I have done last night. I present to you, Mrs. Dalton, what my parents have done, and I put my name on it, as the case may be. Present you, but this is something that Jesus Christ is doing himself. He's not passed it off on anybody else. Sometimes in presentations, we may be ashamed of the work we have done. We don't want anyone to know that we did that wood project because it looks like a two-year-old did it. Who did that? Uh-huh. Who wrote this paper? Uh-huh. Who, who did that? Jesus Christ is not ashamed of what he does. Not ashamed. I read a story about a lady who had made a meal for some friends. She was making spaghetti. And during the day, she realized she'd left the the spaghetti sauce out all day long and quite worried about giving her guests food poisoning. So she called the local poison control center, as the story goes, just to double check to make sure it was fine. They assured her it would be fine, just make sure that she boiled it again to temperature. Well, during the course of the evening, much later that night, the phone rang while the guests were being served. The lady couldn't answer. She asked one of her friends, one of her guests, to answer the phone. The lady came back with a shaken look on her face and The host asked, what was the problem? She goes, that was just the local poison control center asking how the spaghetti sauce turned out. (laughs) Presents you faultless. Presents you a certain way. Jesus Christ is doing something. We're going to look at tonight what he's doing in your life and in my life. Lord, I thank you for this time we have. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have to look at your word. Lord, I pray for your help and your strength. Lord, I need you. Lord, we need you. Lord, you're still the answer. Lord, all that you are is all that we need. Lord, tonight as I speak, I pray that your spirit would speak to us through your word. Lord, that you would teach us, convict us, and correct us. Lord, help us now in this time. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Paul writes in Ephesians a few books back, similar time frame of his life, He says this, we are his, that is Jesus' workmanship. We're his workmanship. We're his project. You and I are a project of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice tonight that Christ has a purpose to present us to God and, and exhibit that he stands alongside. He's working on something. He's working on a project. Michelangelo once was asked what he was doing as he chipped at a shapeless rock. His response, I am liberating the angel from this stone. It seems like Jesus Christ does the same thing in your life and in my life, the ultimate sculptor who is liberating his son and his son's likeness from your life and from my life. Jesus Christ is going to make a presentation He's going to make a presentation. He is shaping us, molding us, and refining us into something that pleases him. I brought something with me tonight for church. 
An illustration, if I may. Brought these things, and you may have seen them at some point on Facebook. My wife posts things. A little while ago, maybe a year and a half ago, 2019, my wife sits us all down. She goes, listen, family, we're going to do a painting project. Now, my wife is an excellent artist and has taught art. Her sister also accomplished and published some things in an art gallery in New York City. My wife sits down and says, listen, I got these, I have these, uh, these five, I think she's six here with, uh, with, with the model, these, these six or these five blank canvases, one to look at, and I'm going to teach you how to paint this, this particular picture. Let's see if I can find the, uh, the master one here so you know what we're looking at in the, in the end. Here it is. I think this is it uh, right here. So sure enough, my wife says, you're going to make a picture that looks like this. Now, my wife is an accomplished, again, accomplished artist. I, I draw a mean stick figure. <laughs> one time, my wife and, and I had an art contest with the kids. I won. Kids voted. See, how did you win, Pastor? Well, mine, mine had more humor in it than hers. We said, hey, we did draw each other, so she drew me, and it was like an accurate portrait of me to scale, right? And I drew her with an oversized foot. It said, look at mommy with a big foot. They're like, oh, daddy, you win. That's funny. And so that's how I win. That's how I win. We had to draw a picture of a pig, and my wife has a pig with a curly tail and the cute little ears, and it's pink and everything, and I drew a picture with bacon. <laughs> kids are like, dad, you win. So I'm more practical street art kind of guy is what I'd say. We uh, painted these pictures. The names are on them, but you can't see the names. And my wife began to just tell us, well, first of all, you, you draw these circles. We started with pencil marks. Can you see them over there a little bit? Or I'll put them on the side too along the way so you can kind of see what's going on here. And draw these, these pencil marks. And from there you, you grab some colors and you begin to, you begin to like add some red and you add some, some blue and then some blacks and some greens. And all of us had to do this. Let's see here, I put out here where they are. I will not tell you all of that they are, but there's one of the family's drawings. There's one over here. All right, there's one here. It's coming there. Yeah, if you can see it, and prop it there. And can you see those a little bit? All right. If you can't, in the back, you should have sat closer tonight in church. That's all I have to say. There we go. And there's our pictures. Now, they all look about, about the same concept, do they not? A vase with flowers. But they're all a little bit different, are they not? If you could see all of them, all, all six of these across the auditorium, you know where you can really see them all at the same time. If you could see all six, you'd notice that there's different, there's different aspects because not everyone was done perfectly. But there was a concept. There was a, there was a model that we're supposed to follow, right? See, Jesus Christ is trying to do something in your life and in my life, and he's trying to have a presentation. He's trying to shape us and mold us and refine us to be and look like him. My wife, I think, is right here, this one right here. That's what they're supposed to look like. Jesus Christ is right here. That's what we're supposed to look like. He's a perfect model. And he is doing things, this verse tells us, in your life and in my life that will help us look like him. I'm going to talk about what he's doing, and then I'm at the end going to tell you why we don't always look like him. Fair enough? This verse gives us <clears throat> a few things. The first thing the verse says he's doing, he's going, to, he's going to present us holy. See that in the verse? Everybody look at that verse, or look at that word, please, holy. Now in this word, holy, it's talking about being a holy vessel. Not to be confused, uh, Peter will say things like this, as ye are called, which is holy, be holy. We are called to holiness in Scripture. But this particular word right here, this concept is not a call to holiness. This holiness is an action done solely by someone who is already holy, and he makes someone else to be holy. This word speaks of what Jesus Christ does when we are saved with no part on our own except acceptance. 
We are called later on to be holy. But when Jesus says he's going to present us holy, this is what he does in your life and he does in my life. We are, once we are saved, we are a holy vessel. We are consecrated. We are sanctified. The word you could also use is there, we are now a saint. We don't always act like saints now, do we? Come on now, we don't act like saints, do we? In fact, we know some Christians who, who act like the opposite of saints. But Jesus, when he saves us, he makes us to be holy so that when we stand before God one day, we will go to heaven because he has made us holy. All right, he has made us holy. He has sanctified us, a holy vessel. We are consecrated. Also, you could say this word, we're the most holy thing. You see, church is not a place to display our holiness. We get bound up in the holiness. Well, I'm holier than them because I do or because I don't or because they do or because they don't. Therefore, I'm better, I'm closer to God, and I'm holier. Church <clears throat> is not a place to dis display our holiness. Church is a place that we display his holiness. I'm on display for him. I'm a nobody. You're a nobody. I'm here to say, God, I'm nothing. You're everything. You see, we, we are quick to condescend if something doesn't fit our paradigm, doesn't fit our thought process. Oh, well, look at that. That place is going liberal. Well, why is that? Well, can't you tell? All right, they never quite give the answer, but they, can't you tell it's going liberal? Like, oh, if, if you had an eyesight of holiness that I had, you could easily tell these things. Oh, can't you tell? We're quick to condescend because we don't comprehend what Jesus has done. Now, that doesn't mean there are right ways and wrong ways to worship. The Bible's clear about that. There are ways to come before him. There are ways not to. That begins in the first few chapters of Genesis with Cain and Abel. They both approached God. God said, Abel, I like the way you approach me, Cain. Not, not, not right. He wasn't angry. He was instructing them at that point. Cain became angry, all right, and God had to judge the anger. But there has always been a way that we're supposed to approach God and a way we're not supposed to approach God. So don't think that you can approach him any way you want to. God cares how we approach him. When they came with strange fire, Nabab and Abihu, God said, no, that's not the way you can approach me. God cares how we approach him. But when we come to church, all right, we come to display his holiness. He's presenting us as a special thing that he has done. It starts and ends with him. And listen, when he presents us, it's not what we have done, it's what he has done. This is my chosen vessel. This is my chosen people. This is my bride. We condescend because we don't comprehend what Jesus has done. This is not an excuse for different standards and convictions. It's not a tolerance for whatever goes. It's an understanding that what Jesus has done in my life and your life, I am not worthy of. When he says he's going to present us before God, I'm not worthy of that. Why would God want me to be his, if I can, his art project? Why would he work with this canvas? Why would he work with this canvas? Could he not have a better canvas to work with? Yes or no? We are flawed people. We have imperfections. We have flawed attitudes and flawed priorities and flawed decisions. We are full of flaws and blemishes. But Jesus Christ, listen, he starts with the canvas that he wants to. He makes us to be holy. As you understand what Jesus has done, understand that this brings a response of holiness, I'm sorry, of humility and thankfulness, that he would choose a canvas like you and me. He goes on to say this, though, not only does he, does he present you, us holy, he uses this other word, unblameable. Holiness regard, is in regard to our spiritual standing. Unblameable is in relation to our earthly matters. This word unblameable has the idea without blemish, no imperfections or cracks. 
No imperfections or cracks. No scrapes, bumps, or bruises. What Jesus Christ wants to do is Jesus Christ wants to take you and wants to take me, and we are full of blemishes. We are full of failures and faults. Every single day, we fail the Lord. We do not live up to his expectation, his example. All right, we are still fleshly. But Jesus Christ, his desire is to make us to be unblameable or to present us with zero blemishes. And he's not just trying to schnooker us. Maybe you've broken something before. A vase, maybe something valuable. And you tried to fix it yourself. A little while back, I broke a pair of rather expensive sunglasses. A pair of Under Armour's about $100, so they weren't super expensive. They were, they were enough that I didn't want to try to use them. So lo and behold, in my drawer, I found a tube of Gorilla Glue. Why not? Gorilla Glue ought to be able to fix everything. I put it back together where it went, glued it. They wouldn't fold after this, but I thought that's no big deal. Who cares? I put this Gorilla Glue on there and let it dry overnight. And this particular the Gorilla Glue that I have did something weird. I've not seen this glue before. I'm used to super glue, which kind of dries clear, right, and almost um, invisible. Gorilla Glue dries yellow and expands, this one did, like expanding foam, Anybody had this experience with this kind of Gorilla Glue? I don't know what I grabbed. Did I grab, like, I think the bottle said, worst glue known to man. And I was like, oh, this will be good. It looks cheap. So I come, down, I come out the next morning, and, and there are my glasses right by the microwave there in the kitchen. And I grab them expecting, like, this is great. I can throw them in my car. And I see black frame, black lenses, black arms on the lenses, or black arms on the frame, and yellow expanding Gorilla Glue foam junk all over the front of it. Now what am I supposed to do? You know? Well, like any good man, I can salvage the project. I can scrape off what I did, scrape off the parts you can see. What do I have that's dark? Oh, magic marker, permanent marker. And I'll color it in, right? Come on, no, don't look at me like that. You know some of you do the same thing. Right, oh, it's about right. Can I sell it on Facebook Marketplace, the right angle? No, of course not. I'm glad that Jesus Christ isn't working that way. Oh, look at that guy, J.D. Boy, that's cracked right there. Here, here, Gabriel, gra grab some of that Gorilla Glue expanding foam junk. <laughs> oh, okay, that's close enough. Here, let's magic marker over that mark. No one will notice. He doesn't do that, does he, though? He's going to make us unblameable without, without blemish. He's going to bring circumstances. He's going to bring situations. He's going to bring things in your life and in my life that will help take out the imperfections. And when he removes the imperfections, he removes them so thoroughly and so cleanly and so completely. When someone else comes by, if they didn't know they had been there before, they wouldn't know it now. That's why people can have a testimony. And you hear their testimony, you say, wow, Jesus Christ, you were that? You struggled with that before? I never would, help me, have known. You know why I wouldn't have known? Because Jesus Christ came in and he said, that's my project right there. I saved that person, I saved that lady, I saved that man, and they have an anger issue. They have an imperfection of anger, and I'm going to clean that out. I'm going to scrape that out. When I get done, no one will know about the anger problem. They'll just see my son, Jesus Christ. I saved this young person over here. They got a problem with their tongue. But when I get done, when I get done, you won't know. This person has no clue, no clue how to handle the marriage relationship. But when I get done, you would have thought they'd been married for 400 years. When Jesus Christ does something, it's magnificent. He's going to present us unblameable. It's like, he, it's like we're a piece of wood and he's carefully sculpting, shaping, molding us. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, a piece falls off, puts it back on. You see, in your life, in my life, the situations that come are there because Jesus Christ is doing something. Good situations are not just because he loves you and you're a good boy today. Not just that reason. He does love us. 
He does bring blessings, but he brings even good things to mold us and shape us. The Bible says this, and I love this, this thought. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. We think it's the beating of God that leads to repentance. The Bible says it's the goodness of God. Wow, God, you brought this, and I'm just nothing but a failure. I've been messing up, and I've not, not had the right priorities, and you're still blessing me. Lord, I, I just can't help but turn back to you. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God, even in the good things, is doing something beautiful. Well, we know during the trying times, the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be. Next word there is perfect, complete, and entire, wanting or lacking in nothing. Jesus Christ it's making something. He says, I'm going to make something that's unblameable. It's without blemish. Then he uses this word, the next word there, and unreprovable. Unblameable is without perfection. Without imperfection, I'm sorry. Unblameable means without accusation. So when Jesus Christ gets done, not only are we holy because he has made us to be holy, his work, not ours, not only are we flawless as he works in us, now no one can point a finger and accuse us. Well, sometimes we face accusations from the brethren. I know your thoughts. I know why you're, you're getting blessed in this because God is in first. I know why you got that new vehicle. Isn't that silly? Isn't that silly? Someone gets something nice. People are thinking, oh, well, their treasures are here on earth, aren't they? Hmm. Boy, they probably should have put that in the offering. Hmm. Boy, I'm going to drive my two-year-old vehicle while they drive their two-month-old vehicle, but, but my priorities are obviously better than theirs. Boy, pastors do it too. A church grows, right? Church grows. Well, I know why they're growing. They're compromising. Well, how are they compromising? Oh, you can tell they are. You can tell. Because people are going. Everyone knows compromising brings more people, right? We do that. Oh, I know why they got the promotion. Because they're seeking their own glory. Listen, my friend. Jesus Christ is going to make us without accusation. But that doesn't mean there won't be accusations now. In fact, in fact, there is an accuser of the brethren. His name is Satan. And Jesus Christ stands beside the Father and defends us. Listen, he answers for you and he answers for me. That's what Jesus does. Not only does he make us holy, not only does he make us to be without blemish, he stands there and defends us and he's the best defense known to man. We have a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's my child. Back off. I wish I knew all the things he said. It'd be perfect. We read about some things he said in the gospel when some of the Pharisees got a little lippy with him. When they began to accuse him of, of falsehood and, and uh, uh, false accusations, and not of himself but of God. And, and, and Jesus stepped right in, didn't he? I think of the lady who was caught in the act of adultery, right? And they brought her to Jesus Christ. He begins to write in the dirt. He got a little snippy in the dirt right there because they all left oldest to youngest. One day we're going to find out what he wrote in that dirt. I don't know what he wrote, but boy, the oldest guy, he's, oh, look at that. Um, my wife's calling. Got to go. Next guy, oh, my goodness, look at the time. I did not see my, my sundial. is telling me that it's high past noon. Time for me to go oldest to youngest. I don't know if he wrote their sins in the ground or if he wrote their names. Who knows what he wrote, but he wrote he defended. Jesus Christ is the defender of the brethren. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And in this passage, it tells me that he will make us so that no one, not even Satan, can bring an accusation or have any grounds for an accusation. All these things in life are to make us presentable. And that verse says this, that we might be holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now that last little phrase, there's some question about whose sight, whether it's God's or Jesus' sight. I believe the verse pretends that God, that Jesus is presenting us to God. But whether we look perfect in God's sight or Jesus' sight doesn't really matter because they're the same. 
Help me here, they're the same. They're both God. So whether it's Jesus' sight, whether it's God's sight, they're going to agree on the end product. The point is this. He's doing something with his view. The person is his view, not my view. I look at the view, and I, I know how to be a better person. I know how to fix the anger in our life, right? Remove this anger, remove this situation right here. If I remove this irritating person, then I'll have no more anger in my life. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'm going to help you be a non-angry person when you're right next to that person. Lord, I know how to have faith in you. Lord, just remove this problem. Remove this problem, and I'll have all the faith I need. I'll trust you. I'll praise you for it. And Jesus says, no, I will make you to have faith in me in this problem. That's what he said to Paul. So that in this infirmity, in this, we in this weakness, you're going to find my strength. You see, we, in our view, know how to be presented to God. We got it all figured out. Go to church, read my Bible, and I'm all set. It's like Jesus says, well, that's fine. But i got to do something a little bit bigger with you. In this area right here, we're going to remove. In this area right here, we're going to water and cultivate. In this area right here, we're going to let flourish. And when I'm done with you, when I'm done with you, you're going to be unbelievably magnificent. You're going to be a presentation that's worthy in my sight. So what happens? We fight the process. We fight the process. Lord, don't do that. Lord, don't do that. I'll fix it myself. Lord, and I know just how to do it. So just help me here. I'll give you a good plan. I'll give you three steps. Lord, I know how to do it. Lord, would you change the situation? I don't like what's happening here. We fight the process. Listen, Christian, don't fight the process. He's making something beautiful. There was a man. The man named Alan Peterson. He would be what you would consider to be a nobody. Just a member of an ordinary church, ordinary man. He was watched by a pastor one time. A pastor grew up in the church of this man named Alan. pastor gives, or the man gives this impression of Alan. He said Alan was just a monument of faith in Christ. The report goes, as a young believer, I saw Alan as he lost his wife, yet his faith in Jesus Christ didn't waver. He mourned the loss of his wife, but simultaneously expressed confidence in the Lord's promise and promises. The man says this, that Alan used to walk around the church wearing a button, a button on his suit coat. And this is what caught my attention in this particular story. The button had these letters on it. Are you ready for me? All right? If you're taking notes, you'll never catch these. Here are the letters on the button. P-B-P-W-M-G-I-N-F-W-M-Y. I'll give them to you one more time. P-B-P-W-M-G-I-N-F-W-M-Y. Now, I'm sorry. If you wore that button at church, I'd ask what was going on right there. Well, it seemed like a big button, right? One time, this new believer asked Alan, who was just, in his eyes, the shining pillar of faith in Jesus Christ <clears throat> through calamity, through tragedy. He said, what, is, what, is your, what does your button mean? What do those letters mean? And Alan said this. He said, it means, please be patient with me. God is not finished with me yet. Pretty good button. My friend, be patient. God's not finished with you yet. Until you stand before God, until that day, he's molding you. He's refining. He's seeing the imperfections and he's getting them out. He's not just duct taping or gorilla gluing them away. He's seeing areas that maybe the accuser could have a reason to accuse you and he's helping bring victory in your life. And One day he'll present you before God. And you'll be worthy, not in your sight, but in his sight. Don't fight the process. Let him work. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in my life. 
Lord, in lives of every single saint. Lord, I fear that sometimes we hinder the process. Lord, that we hinder what you want to do because we have a better plan or it's too painful. Lord, may we just let you work in our life. Lord, you're doing something magnificent, something amazing. Lord, it's all about you. I wonder if you're night, my friend. Heads bowed and eyes closed. You say, Pastor, would you pray for me that I wouldn't hinder the process, that I wouldn't fight the process. Pastor, would you pray for me because I see what Jesus wants to do, but right now maybe it hurts. Right now I don't quite like what he's doing, and I want to believe, and I know in my deep down that what he's doing is right, but I don't like it right now. Pastor, would you pray for me that I don't fight the process? I don't hinder it, that I let him do what he wants to do. Who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I don't want to fight the process. Amen. My friend, in just a moment, we'll stand and pray. Let God do what he wants to do. The song the pianist is playing, let the Lord have his way in your life every day. Lord, I pray tonight that we would be honest and transparent before you. But we don't always like the process. But sometimes it hurts down here. Sometimes we don't see what you're doing and we don't understand what you're doing, Lord, and we, we are tempted to question you. Lord, we have to know that you're good. What you're doing is right. Lord, may we respond and do business with you tonight. In Jesus' name. As you stand to your feet, heads bowed, eyes closed. If God's touched your heart, you respond now. Don't hinder what he wants to do. He's making something beautiful. Let the Lord have his way in your life every day. What's he want to do in your life? What's he's try what is he trying to cut out? What is he trying to change and mold? What's there that shouldn't be there? And you know it. And he knows it. But you just fight. thank you. I pray that we'd let you have your way in our life every single day. Lord, may we not fight what you're doing. And Lord, what you make is going to be beautiful, magnificent. Lord, thank you for all that you do and how you are producing a crowning achievement. Because of your grace and mercy, Lord, nothing that we can take any credit for. Lord, thank you for what you're doing here at the church in lives and hearts. Lord, each week we see your hand at work here. Lord, may we please you and honor you in what we do and say in how we live. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.